This is the Emu Systems Sampling Percussion or SP1200 first released in 1987. If you're into hip hop, drum and bass or house, you'll no doubt be aware of the significance of this unit and understand why they now trade for thousands on the second hand market. Now Emu's history is a story for another time, but in a nutshell, by the 1980s, founders Dave Rossum and Scott Wedge had already established a potent combination of analog and digital engineering ingenuity, but needed to produce some new products of their own after royalties from their parts of the Profit 5 ceased. Their idea was to design a sampling synthesizer to compete with the Fairlight, and the solution was the Emulator in 1981. This was succeeded by the hugely famous Emulator 2 in 1984, which again is another story for another time. Accompanying the Emulator series was a humble little digital drum machine called the Drumulator. Now this is the first digital drum machine to be sold for under $1,000 upon its release in 1983 and wound up being a huge success selling thousands of units and appearing in numerous recordings such as the Cocteau Twins, Tears for Fears, Kelly Loggins, Howard Jones, Rockwell and others. In 1985, Emu brought a work in progress Drumulator 2 to the Winter NAMM show, but when the final product saw the light of day in 1986, it was now called the SP12. What was significant about this unit was that as well as the onboard sounds, it allowed you to record in your own samples. You only had 1.2 seconds at 27 kHz and 12 bit, or 5 seconds with a later turbo upgrade but this captured the imagination of musicians and producers alike and offered a glimpse of what was to come. And that was the SP-1200 that succeeded the SP-12 in 1987. The 1200 actually had slightly lower fidelity than its earlier sibling at 26 kHz, or 26.04 depending upon who you're asking, and 12 bit, but the total sample time was extended to 10 seconds. The maximum a single sample could be was 2.5 seconds, and whilst 32 sounds could be loaded up at once, if they were small enough, the unit only had 8 voice polyphony, meaning that only 8 sounds could be used simultaneously. So this all sounds painfully limited, right? Well, the limitations and simplicity of the unit combined with its sound made it incredibly intuitive and rewarding and allowed musicians to quickly make the main body of a track all within one box without having to be in the studio. Furthermore, as well as becoming frugal with their sample times, producers discovered tricks like sampling a 33 RPM record at 45 RPM plus so that it ate the smallest part of your 10 seconds as possible. They would then pitch the sample back down afterwards, which introduced a distinctive crunch and ring as the aliasing created from the low fidelity made its presence known. Now the SP-1200 has eight individual outputs as well as the mono bus, but these aren't run of the mill outs. The first two have SSM 2044 low pass filters in the signal path, controlled by a very basic decay envelope. The SSM chips of course also being the handiwork of Dave Rossum. The jacks are stereo with the filtered output from the ring and the unfiltered from the tip. However, if you play around with pulling the cable half out, you can remove the filter from the equation. Outputs 3 to 6 have fixed filters, which again can be clumsily bypassed, and outputs 7 and 8 are not filtered at all. So depending upon where you route a signal to, the result is very different.
Now I've read that some of the very late production units have an alternative to the SSM 2044 because those ICs were no longer in production by that point. And as the unit I've borrowed is from that final run, it's quite possible that that is what we're listening to, but I'd have to open it up and poke around inside to be sure. And I doubt the owner would be very keen on the idea of me and a screwdriver. Now sampling on this guy is pretty simple. You hook up an instrument, microphone or turntable into the rear jack, navigate to the sample menu, set your gain, bearing in mind that overloading the input stage affects the outcome, which can be used creatively. You then set your sample time from 0.1 to 2.5 seconds and define whether to start sampling when you activate it or more conveniently, automatically start sampling when the incoming audio passes a predefined threshold. Once your sample is good, you can truncate it using the sliders. Now this is quite a rudimentary way of blindly editing a sample, especially when compared to the precision we have now, but this method of chopping is another big part of the end result. Another significant part of the character of the 1200 is what Emu called multi-mode. This allows for eight variations of your pitch, decay or level settings to be applied to a sample. As well as the obvious pitch options this now gives you, producers also used to use multi-mode level to set up a kind of faux delay effect, a technique that you also see employed by MPC users. Another trick was to record the same sample across eight pads and set different tunings so that chords could be played. Now there is much debate online about the character of the internal clock and the swing of the SP1200. This may or may not be true, and I'm not going to pretend to have the engineering knowledge to answer that, but it could also be down to the way the samples are truncated or chopped on the machine, meaning that they're not super precise. So perhaps that could at least in part explain the loose feel and the funky vibe of the 1200. In terms of end users, the 1200 crops up in hip hop, rap and boom bap records by Pete Rock, RZA, Method Man, Wu-Tang Clan, Jay Diller, A Tribe Called Quest, Todd Terry, Freddie Fresh, Dr. Dre, DJ Premier, The Beastie Boys, Public Enemy, Larry Heard, Easy Mo B, Mad Lib and goodness knows how many others. It also appears in the music of Ronnie Size and The Prodigy in the UK and in French House in particular with Daft Punk and Alan Brax being famous users. According to the original sound on sound review of the SP1200, it cost £2,199 in 1987, which is about £6,300 or $8,730 in today's money. And they're well on the way to returning to their original price, at least relatively on the second hand market. Demand for the SP1200 meant that production runs originally continued for over a decade. And I like that the unit that I have has a plaque saying final edition as if they were saying, all right, guys, that'll do. Nowadays, people modify them with floppy drive emulators instead of using ancient disks. And in fact, if you're a fan of modern conveniences, your SP1200 dreams can be explored with the brand new Isla S2400, which was released in 2020. Or if you've got the cash and some patience, you can even get a rebuilt 35th anniversary SP1200 from Dave Rossum himself. Unbelievably, he's still active and still designing new products five decades after EMU was founded. And it's no doubt that the landscape of music would have looked very different without them. And this box is one of the many reasons why. Ooh.